Yeah. Shout outs to Paul, always has the uh, interesting discourse and discussions to talk about. This is the plus channel here. Okay. Saw this on my feed and I was like, hang on a second. Did someone just share an opinion on the internet? Well, hey guys, I need Paul to get involved. At, well, I need to get in on this. You can't just make opinions on the internet and not have another Yugi YouTuber superimpose themselves on that opinion. All right. Uh, let us, uh, let's, uh, let's do a quick little react, Andy. So I know it's been a while since I've done one of these talking videos of an APS amplifier. Talking I just been video. thinking a lot about Yu-Gi-Oh! And I uh, wanted to share with you guys. Get Is the volume opinions. good chat? Are we good enough? It's gonna be a, Are we not equal? Not a rant, but maybe not like a completely positive video. There's going to be some critiques. I know some people don't like when I do that. So if you can't handle oh, it, you don't can't shit on the Yu-Gi-Oh! community, um, Paul. Can, then let's talk a little bit about Yu-Gi-Oh! and its sort of target audience and the misalignment that I think Konami has kind of run into in recent years. So I'm going to just set the stage a little bit here. We I'm going to hazard a guess here and tell you that the misalignment between Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, uh, target demographic on Konami's side, uh, being that it's a kid's game, but it's also uh, uh, it's also just kind of disconnected from the original player base, which is us, like literal 30-year-old men, you know? Right here is what this exactly reminds me of. When the target audience doesn't exactly work out with who they're intended for, you know? The target audience of Yu-Gi-Oh! is probably exactly like Pokemon here, right? The target audience is literal children, um, but the actual audience uh, is 30-year-old grown-ass men. As an experiment, uh, type your age in the chat if you're willing to dox yourself. I guarantee you that like most people, at least here who are watching, are like 25 plus, you know? Got mid-20s, 29, 23, 31, 20, 24, 29, 30, 25, 27, 26. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh's player base? is grown-ass adults. I swear, half the people I encounter have, like, girlfriends, long-term partnerships. Some of them have children, uh, freaking mortgages. Like, you know, these... We, as a generation, the millennial generation, grew up with Yu-Gi-Oh! And we just never let it go. And we just continue our lives, and here we are. Um, so continuing to market it that way seems... Uh, or not address that as one of the potential target audiences is kind of bizarre, right? Because Magic knows its audience. And that's why most Magic players are, uh, you know... All of them have, like, university-level educations because they're grown-ass men. We know anyway. it's been around for, like, a bazillion years. 20, 25 years. A lot of people got into this game as kids watching the show. Um, but today, the game is a lot more... Um, it's more niche, for sure. And it's also much more competitive. There's a lot more information that goes around. A lot of people um, who play the game today are playing it for the sake of competing in, like, tournaments or Master Duel or whatever. And there's much more talk about, you know, a meta game and what you're supposed to do, what are combo lines... What I, I, I genuinely curious, like, what the actual breakdown of the player base is. Like, what is the YCS attendee slash... I will go to a YCS maybe once a year. I will maybe go to a Nationals. I will maybe go to a Regionals. What is that category of player and how much percentage of the actual revenue share do they provide for Konami? I'm very curious. I feel like it's significantly higher than people give it credit for. Because I feel like there's sometimes a bit of a myth that the Yu-Gi-Oh! player base is or rather the, the whales of the community, um, are the people who like just mass buy like boxes at locals and open packs for fun and collect. Like I, I think some people seem to think that that's like the main driving force behind you. I don't think that's true. I think it's the competitive player base that actually really drives the game. Um, which begs the question why the game isn't more targeted towards um, competitive duelists. I could be completely missing the, the mark on this. I could be completely wrong. I don't know. Uh, but I think uh, that's probably the breakdown. What is counterplay, you know, hand traps, interactions, rulings, it's a lot more nitty gritty. And particularly online in that corner, in a sort of online discourse, you know, people are going to talk mostly about that. When you think of Yu-Gi-Oh!, you think of people online discussing combos, where to hand trap something, how to stop things, you know, what's the metagame like, what's the next ban list going to be. The reason I'm talking about this today is because um, they've recently started playing the Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel deck flexing series at YCS event streams. So what deck flexing is, is it's the series that Alec and I actually got to be a part of. We were the commentators. I haven't heard of this. Is this an NA only thing? What is deck flexing? For it, but um, it's a three-part series where every episode they got like Konami, they Konami got uh different people from different. Oh right, oh, God, yeah, it's I remember what that is. Yeah, it's just uh, it's not a very well-performing thing that they're doing on their main channel, but yeah, it's like uh, they get a bunch of random people from like other communities and stuff, and they bring them into Master Duel and they play a duel. Yeah, that's what that is. Communities to play in these themed Yu-Gi-Oh matches. So it might have been like Justin Wong from the fighting game community, or like VTubers like Rosemi Lovelock. Yeah, there we um, go. Or even like people like Rhyme Style and Syriax, and so they were given themes. Like, uh, you know, old school Yu-Gi-Oh, as in like, you know, Legend of Blue Eyes, Magic Ruler, Pharaoh Servant, Metal Raiders, that kind of era. Um, Doesn't it, by the way, like kind of uh, raise some questions and sort of like, you know, highlight the entire 
disconnect within the game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Why is it that whenever Konami try and bring on other people from other communities outside of Yu-Gi-Oh, it is almost always like based off of like anime decks, childhood decks, nostalgia, that kind of stuff. It always is, right? They never give them like, here's like a competitive modern meta deck, right? Why? Uh, because it's a million times more complicated and difficult to play. Uh, even though the even though the reality is like that's the only format that exists in the game. That sounds like a problem that should be addressed, right? Or like anime duels like uh, Stardust versus Elemental Heroes. That was kind of one of, that was one of the themes. And so we did this series and it was pretty fun. I had a great time. It was it was fun to record, um, fun to get to meet those people and work with them. And I think Nami did a really great job in the editing. The episodes turned out really well. They decided that they would show these episodes um, between YCS stream matches because at YCS you know, events, the feature matches happen and then like there's a bit of a downtime between them and whatever the next match is. Not in EU coverage, Giga Chad. And normally Konami just kind of sits the camera up there and like just shoots into the crowd and nothing really happens. Not with EU coverage, Giga Chad. Happens, it's kind of boring. So there's some space to fill. And so they decided to, um, I guess, among other product advertisements and stuff, they put the Master Duel deck flexing videos on there because it's sponsored Konami content. So I guess they're allowed to do that. Um, but there are some people who are some dissenters, we'll say, who maybe don't think that that's the best decision. Because when you're watching a YCS stream, you don't really want to watch people play, you know, Man Eater, Bug, like, and Celtic Guardian control decks, right? Un uh, I don't mind, like, the mix-up of content uh, in between the uh, the duels. So, like, in EU, we have, like, a wide variety and stuff. This this year, at YCS Bologna, I think we absolutely blew it out the park. For any of you guys who watched the YCS coverage, you probably noticed how, like, amazing the uh, in-between matches were. We had legacy formats. We had combo tutorials. Like, actual contextry, contextual to the current uh, metagame contemporary gameplay uh showing you modern combo decks and how to play them like that's the kind of thing you would probably want to see in a ycs stream and i think it was all uh really good on stream you would rather watch people <clears throat> play you know the current metagame what's going on with runics and bestials what's going on with you know rescue ace and snake eyes and sp i don't mean to be rude but with a pile of blue eyes cards just put in three striker dragon and you have dragon link that's not how dragon link works but thank you for your deck building advice uh, that that's you can't make striker dragon with half the blue eyes deck but noted little knight and combos and hand traps i mean you can i suppose but things and so i've seen some people link off made them that you know Konami was playing these sorts of videos on stream they weren't really satisfied with them they were like okay get this casual content out of my face right this isn't really <laughs> this isn't the target audience for that get and, this um, casual content comments, out of my so face really dude. Videos. It sucks to hear them say that. <laughs> i don't want to see this normie garbage i don't want to see Jaden fusion summon flame wingman what is this they don't like them, but when I thought about it a little bit more, I think it does make some sense. You know, maybe Konami shouldn't be showing these at YCS events that are targeted towards much more hardcore, very competitive times. Does Paul not watch but European question, events? Because exactly it's night and day the difference. Intended audience for Yu-Gi-Oh, and where does Konami stand in terms of like how they reach that crowd? Because for Konami, they kind of have to walk two. Um, they have to kind of walk like two. By the way, just as like as a thing, right? Like the the live streams are supposed to be like advertising channels for uh for Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Like it's supposed to like promote the game and advertise the game. Who do you think the majority of people that watch an official Konami YCS stream are? It's preaching to the choir. I don't think there is any, like, non-Yu-Gi-Oh players who watch. Like, it, I, I, I just, I don't know how you would be able to find that, but who is watching those streams that aren't Yu-Gi-Oh players? Like, I don't think those streams are, like, bringing any, but, like, it's very much one of those, like, preach to the choir kind of things. Like, I, I've never heard socially any kind of, like, any of my friends who are like geeks or nerds, like, oh, hey, I randomly saw this Yu-Gi-Oh stream the other day. Like, I, I've never heard people say that. I don't know. Two lanes. Two, like, it's two only Yu-Gi-Oh players who watch Yu-Gi-Oh streams. The, you know, keeping the current competitive crowd happy, those are the people that you're mostly going to meet online that talk about, you know, the nitty-gritty of decks, optimizations, how you beat the meta, right? Lots of content today is about that. But then there's also um, a side that's much more, like, casual, and their memories of Yu-Gi-Oh! are from the show, are from the anime. And they might find themselves a bit disillusioned by all of this, you know, super complex, jargon-filled, competitive talk. And so Konami's got to try to market like product. Okay, this is kind of like an interesting point some chatter has brought up here, but it's, it's very different, okay? That's like saying people who watch Smite live streams are only Smite Jesus. players, like, oh, wow, never would have guessed. That is not completely true. If there is a game that has a big enough event going on you will find that people sort of like leak in from other communities and stuff and they watch. And here's the kicker, other games are much easier to follow. I've watched like random, you know, Overwatch tournaments and stuff like that, even though I haven't played in like a year and a half, et cetera, et cetera, because like it's easy to follow. When you tune in to like random tournaments for like Counter-Strike or Call of Duty or League of Legends, they're very relatively easy to follow on screen. 
you might not know the ins and outs of all of the abilities and cooldowns being used, but when you watch a League of Legends stream and the guy with the health bar hits zero and dies, you can you understand what happened. Like, that's a good thing. Wow. A flashy ability happens and the enemy died. That team is clearly winning, etc. Right? You watch a Yu-Gi-Oh! tournament uh, live stream. There's nothing to really understand. Like, how are you watching that? Like, how are you gaining anything from that? Do you know what I mean? How Overwatch is easy to follow? Okay, what's easier to follow as a non-player of that particular game? Do you think it's easier to watch Tracer kill someone? Or do you think it's easier to watch uh, Hani and Pak have a tier of Shizu mirror? Which one do you think is easier to follow? Products and try to expand the reach to more and more people. And to do that, they get these people from other communities when they do like these sorts of initiatives. And so like when that content gets seen by the nitty gritty crowd, they are dissatisfied and don't like it. So um, I think that in terms of what the like, the, so for the YCS issue, right? That's a simple matter of, I guess, maybe people just don't want them to include deck flexing in like in between YCS rounds. I think that'd be pretty reasonable, I suppose. Maybe deck flexing has a better place to be put on the internet. Like it could just be like an ad on Facebook or YouTube in general. But I think um, the more important conversation to be had here is like, who is Yu-Gi-Oh! for and how does Konami kind of cater to both? And I think it comes down to the fact that... That's a good question. How, do, how do you address that? Is who is Yu-Gi-Oh! for? How do you address that? Almost, I hesitate to use this word. It's a little deceptive, a little duplicitous, maybe even, dare I say, a bit of a lie. So when you look at how Konami sort of markets Yu-Gi-Oh! today, you will see like these, you know, like these tins, right? Like this year's hero tins or um, some playmats and stuff where like they use a lot of imagery of Yu-Gi and Kaiba and Jaden or Yusei and like their boss monsters. It's meant to evoke Object. this sort of... Um, sense of like you know anime style duels where it's kind of back and forth and there's like an epic boss monster clash and you know it sort of feels like you could it's like what you and they're never competitively relevant by the way those anime decks and stuff like that which i've always said right in pokemon one of the best decks in the game right now is charizard i don't know what kind or what type if it's dark charizard or yellow charizard or freaking uh cocaine charizard i don't i don't know like the version um but that's easy to understand. I haven't played TCG Pokemon ever. But if I tune into a Pokemon game and I see Charizard going pew pew with his like fire breath, I'm like, oh, Pog, I know that character. I know that character. Right? And Yu Gi Oh! Uh, Blue Eyes has been meta for one format. Dark Magician has been a decent rogue deck maybe once in like 2017 or 16 or something. And that's it. That's it. Um, so I strongly, strongly believe, unironically, Blue Eyes, Dark Magician should be the best decks in the game, even at a competitive standpoint. They should make support cards for Blue Eyes, Dark Magician, for heroes, um, for, you know, uh, all the different anime characters, like uh, whatever Alexis's main deck is, whatever Bastion's main deck is. All of that should be meta. That should be Those should be the best decks, because it's easy to recognize. People can jump in and be like, oh, Flame Wingman is the best monster in Yu-Gi-Oh. That's really cool. I know what that is. I saw that when I was a kid. You know what I mean? Um, cause now today you join the game and you're like, oh, the best deck in Yu-Gi-Oh is a fire truck. That's really cool. Huh? I wonder how many, like, do <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Ishizu was meta. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. People definitely resonate with Medora for sure. hundred percent. When I think of iconic Yu-Gi-Oh cards, I definitely don't think of blue eyes and dark magician. I think of fucking Agido. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember when you were a kid, right? These cool anime duels and all that. But then there's a bit of an issue because modern Yu-Gi-Oh, when you actually go to a local card shop or even get on Master Duel, isn't really like that. And so the marketing kind of feels like a bit of a slap in the face because you get baited and switched. You get baited into thinking that, you know, Dark Magician and Blue Eyes are still the cool, strong monsters when in reality they couldn't be kind of further from it, right? Like, you know, we haven't really seen a Dark Magician or a Blue Eyes deck do super well in a competitive tournament. Yeah, that's like exactly what I've been saying. In ages, and um, it's really quite rare. If anything, those are seen as the free win, the free round for a lot of more competitive types of players. And it's not exactly as easy to market, you know, branded or um, or unchained or, you know, like rescue a snake eye to a lot of older fans because they don't recognize those cards. In fact, when I go to... <laughs> it's very easy to recognize how good Labyrinth and Diabell Star is, right? And Ray, very so easy to recognize why those cards are cool and why those cut, right? Right? I can't think of any reason. Events like conventions, like that, best or even just reading the comments in my own like videos, there are a lot of people who kind of want to get back into Yu-Gi-Oh, but find themselves alienated not just by you know the the long combos and the long card text, but also just the unfamiliarity of the cards, the fact that you know Mirror Force is no longer seen as like a good card, or Monster Reborn is not seen as a good card, it's not played, and they don't really you know want to maybe learn what all the new crazy stuff is. And I think to that point, I'd say that well. There's some like both sides kind of got to maybe give a little to get a little. I think that if you are the quintessential Yugi boomer, as they call them, um, it 
I think that it is important to kind of like take a step out of your comfort zone and realize that modern Yu-Gi-Oh does have some some real like shining sides to it. It's a lot more complex, sure, and there's a lot more moving parts, but I do think that the game is actually at perhaps its most like high octane and interactive that it's ever been. And getting I wonder if the transference of uh, Yugi Boomers slash um, older players or used to nostalgia bait, like used to play players, ever like goes into modern Yu-Gi-Oh after like people who come back from breaks after like 10 years and stuff like that. There's plenty of people who have done it. I just wonder like how common it is, you know. Uh, there's plenty of people I've spoken to like, yeah, I haven't played since like 2012. I haven't played since the start of the game. Uh, you know, a couple of people came up to me at the YCS this weekend and they were literally like, you know, I started playing because of you. I got my first YCS top uh, or like regional top and stuff like that just from starting out playing the game, which is unbelievable that someone would put themselves through the uh, the hyperbolic time chamber that is required to learn like Yu-Gi-Oh from scratch today. But it does happen and it does exist. Um... I just don't think it's very common from people who haven't at least had some sort of experience with the game as, at a younger age, right? Uh, but I, it, it must happen, you know. I just think, like, generally people who come back to the game are usually people who were like, I played this when I was a kid, or I remember this anime. Uh, coming straight out fresh as a Yu-Gi-Oh player, as, like, I don't know, a student or something, I don't know if that's, like, really common, unless you have, like, lots of experience with, like, Yu-Gi-Oh as a media rather than a specific card game, perhaps. But I could be wrong. And taking the time to like learn how a lot of today's decks works can be really, it, I think it can be really um, rewarding <clears throat> and really gratifying to learn that. I have some... It's not that hard if you have the brain power. Listen, buddy, I understand that you think, and many people like you echo this exact same thought where Yu Gi Oh isn't very difficult. You just have to, like, you know, you, you just have to think, you just have to use your brain power. It's like, yes, Yu Gi Oh is not that difficult fundamentally. Main phase, battle phase, how damage works, how card effects works, PSCT, you could learn all of that. What you don't understand, it's lots of lots and lots of what is relatively simple stuff, except probably like the Battle Fates and PSCT, by the way, are, that, that is not that simple. Um, when you compound all of that with all of the information of the game that's been accumulated over 20 years of power creep, uh, it, the, the game is very easy. Uh, the game is very difficult. Does it, if I give you lots of easy numbers to remember, like 27 and 33, right? That's easy to remember, right? If I give you like 100 of those numbers to remember within the space of like, you know, an hour, uh, that, that's hard, right? It's easy to remember two digits, right? Well, try memorizing like 100 pairs of those two digits, right? That That's kind of like how Yu-Gi-Oh is. Yes, each individual thing is relatively simple, but try and absorbing all of that at once and then producing it into a real game while also knowing how your deck works and what the combos are, it's difficult. It's difficult. Stop saying Yu-Gi-Oh is easy if you have a brain. Like that is such... A dismissive, uh, just arrogant take. I don't know why people think that. It's just, that is absolutely not true. Certainly have a fun time like playing, you know, the really harsh and modern formats of like Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. But I totally get why somebody might not want to. I think on the other end of the spectrum, though, you've got some competitive players who just can't really find any appreciation for, you know, watching this even just pre-Time Wizard style format being played in front of them, they would much rather see, okay, why isn't Jesse Cotton or, you know, Joshua Smith coaching these VTubers and like coaching Justin Wong and playing, you know, in a modern format with modern cards and, you know, showing that instead. And I think that there are some obvious sort of... How is the uh, legacy format perceived for people on the YCS EU streams? I'm curious, like, how you guys feel about watching Juho or Jesse play, like, Gulp format and Tengu Plant was this past weekend at Bologna. Like, was that well received? I don't know. I didn't really read the comments. I didn't see what the viewership was like. But even if it's like a legacy older format that's easier to follow, I think it's probably quite enjoyable to see players who are that good play even simple Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, even if it's a competitive YCS stream, I, I think it's cool. I don't know how, like, how it was well received, though. It seems mostly positive from the uh, chat here. Logistic reasons why that couldn't really be like super feasible. Um, but yeah, there's always going to be this sort of mismatch. And I think that for Konami, they could probably help address this issue a little bit. You need they, practice, they have, practice on Tengu Plant. Right? Like they've got time. Dude, formats, honestly, so. I'm actually not bad at Tengu Plant. It's just that that specific turn was like really bad. Uh, I should just econ the reborn Tengu. Everything would have been fine. I What I thought he was going to do was try bait with Maxi. So because he didn't Maxi on attack declaration, uh, I assumed that's what he was going to do was try like Maxi bait and draw like 10 cards with uh, Tengu. So I was going to wait for the Maxi, then then econ it, but he didn't do that. So I was just like, well, we've committed. So um, yeah, anyway, let's uh, stick to the video. Can technically play GOAT. That's kind of one of the things that I always will point to for people who just Copium want something shuttle. that old school Yu-Gi-Oh! Or you can play Edison <laughs> format. But I think that in particular, Master Duel, first of all, needs to have um, some uh, some super like old casual formats. It's got a casual mode. We all know that that is not 
at all like good. It doesn't really work or function. People go in there and troll. There's no rewards for doing so. It's Imagine joining casual but ranked really easy to do that in or casual even within the TCG, in Macedonia, your opponents just playing Dragon Link. More, um, sort of, like, happens all the time. For these types of formats, like Konami themselves never really quite want to, at least that I've noticed, they, they always kind of keep an arm's length from what they'll describe as like the uh, Heart of the Underdog format or the Time Wizard format. They'll kind of leave it to the players to just, uh, you guys sort of figure out what format you want to play and you guys can play that and we're going to take a bit of a backseat to it. But I think that they should take a more active role in doing so and maybe actually have a little bit more faith in their modern archetypes and cards. Like, for instance, the Sky Striker archetype gets a lot of support and it actually has a manga in Japan, but that's not something that we get here. We don't even really get those, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! sort of... You guys might, like, hate this, which is obviously completely understandable, but controversial, real take. Um, Sky Striker is one of the best decks ever made in terms of the health of the game. Like... Sky Striker does not really do anything particularly degenerate. The turns aren't exactly like like forever. Uh, it's very interactive. It teaches you a lot of like interaction with your opponent. Uh, <laughs> for all the hate that Ray gets, um, Sky Striker is one of the best decks ever made for this game. And I hate that deck personally. But I can appreciate how good Sky Striker is for, for, for the game. Uh, master guides or whatever where they explain the lore of different archetypes we don't get that here in the west so it's a lot more to connect with archetypes and so if you're maybe a more casual or returning player who just remembers celtic guardian and um you know mystical elf then it might be harder to connect with these new archetypes but it's i think it's good because ios band sure releasing these lore books or maybe releasing some like animated shorts like what pokemon does so that people could get to know who you know like diabelle that's too much money what if they you know if konami just canceled ycs's for one year i would be down because they could put that budget hypothetically you know that uh, League of Legends anime they made, Arcana or something? Bro, they do that for the World Legacy storyline or the branded storyline? Do you know how many people would flood into Yu-Gi-Oh? If they made something as, as, le as, as w high quality, as well designed as Arcane, uh, but for, for the Alba story or a world, bro, I would coom. I would coom, dude. Star and the snake they would actually just Alabama absorb like 50 far. million new players that, if that it was that good. Because otherwise, it kind of creates a bit of a weird disconnect. Connect, thank you. To get into we don't need more branded players, true. It was like when they were a kid, because I'll go to conventions and people are like, you know, cosplaying as like Jaden and Cyrus, and they just, you know, make jokes about like, you know, what does Potter Greed do? They're having a more innocent and kind of nostalgia driven fun with the brand and property that is not at all reflected in the game. Our story is weak. Fine. World Legacy, can we agree on one? Do you like any of them? So, um, you know, I think Konami's got to take some steps to sort of solve this. Speed Duels is another pretty good one. I, that's one that I've found myself recommending to people a little bit more as well. So that's really good. I think that the or way Visa, they're doing them as like sure. sealed boxes. That are has so many good storylines. Kind of boxed experiences that you could play with a group of friends from middle school without actually going online and like kind of looking into the deep nitty gritty of Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh yeah, also a uh, Speed Duel box, but for like modern Yu-Gi-Oh would be really insane. Uh, genuinely. You know how like in the Battle City Speed Duel boxes, you can just pick up a box and like you have like four decks you can play right now immediately with your friends? Literally do that for, like, TCG, I think would be sick. Exactly. I think, like, dude, a speed, do uh, a Battle City box with, like, a full Sword Soul deck. Um, maybe, like, a full Branded deck. Like, some basic parts of Branded, you know? Because, don't forget, Branded has, a, has had, like, three versions. You wouldn't, need to pl you wouldn't need to put in, like, the brand new one with all of the crazy expensive stuff. Like, a very basic Branded structure deck. Uh, what else could be good? Maybe, like, Salomon Great and Tri Brigade? Sky Strike? There's a million different options, you know? Um... Sword Soul and Branded are not allowed in Speed Duel. This guy's not listening to me today, is he? This. <laughs> Sorry, do you did you think I was suggesting Sword Soul and Branded should be Speed Duel? That this guy's not listening to me. This guy's been popping off on me today, dude. For the best, I I really do believe that. I do think that competitive Yu-Gi-Oh online today, getting getting into that community. And like Who is sports, he talking? It's it's rough. I mean, there, there there was like a recent argument on Twitter about you know somebody saying that they Jesus thought that some so like Earth Arctic bro. was a. Um, was like a decent deck and people that was the worst like arc of yugi twitter this year i don't care dude screw all like the uh insane like you know dp ygo takes we've seen recently holy crap that was bad by the way you know what the worst like tw twitter drama this year was was the earth arctic is not a good deck drama that was the single worst drama i've seen in in yugioh like i i hated that like, an actual, like, week-long debate about Earth's Arctic being a good deck, dude. Holy crap. I just, I, <laughs> I wanted to uninstall, there's nothing I wanted to do more than uninstall Twitter that week. It was insane. People got angry at them and said, like, what? No, you're wrong. Earth's Arctic is trash. How dare you defend it? And, like, I mean, it was, like, it, How it dare got you really defend personal it? and, like, harsh. And so I sometimes tell people, like, listen, if you want to get into Yu-Gi-Oh! today, 
uh, decide how you want to get into it, right? Do you want to get into a kind of a very intense competitive online community? Not saying it's bad, but it's intense. Or do you maybe just want to enjoy something that's more akin to what you played in like middle school or something? If so, don't look online for anything. Just buy a speed duel box, grab a few friends who you know also don't know anything, play it, then pack it back up and you can do it again some other time and that's it, right? It's rough to say it that way, but as it stands in Yu-Gi-Oh, it sometimes feels like those are the two options that you get. Bridging that Dude, I don't know, like, it's the thing is, by nature, Yu-Gi-Oh is always going to feel like, toxic is the wrong word, but intense, right? It's a competitive card game. It doesn't matter how much for fun you're doing. In the end, by virtue of the game's existence, mechanically, the entire objective of Yu-Gi-Oh is to reduce your opponent's life points to zero and win, right? So by nature, it is a competitive game, right? Uh, the degree to which you take that competitiveness seriously will vary from person to person, but fundamentally Yu-Gi-Oh is a competitive game, right? So you can't really Jesus avoid that uh, aspect of, of, of Yu-Gi-Oh, right? And that's just where, like, modern level, um, modern gaming is today, right? Like, in the end, like, in any game, in any card game, in any video game, like, the objective is, like, either to uh, diminish someone else's resources uh, or fulfill your own. And that gives you victory to some capacity. And because that's a competitive nature, in player versus player, you will always find some sort of uh, degree of toxicity. Well, toxic again, toxicity is not the right right word, just intensity, you know? And gap is going to be a difficult uh, one. Can I say thank you to some subs? Sorry. Zestrea, thank you so much for the 34 months. Ryan, Joe, thank you for the 45 months. 25 months from J uh, Junior Khamez and Koneko, thank you for the 16 months. Ardo, thank you for the 9 months. Atrip Pit Pitfall, thank you for the 27 months. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the subs, resubs. You guys are the best. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. I thought I was at a fever dream when I saw people calling Arsarctic good. Again, like, but the thing is, like, <laughs> that whole debate is, like, in, where are you putting the goalposts, right? That's the problem with, like, understanding how good a Yu-Gi-Oh deck is and bothered it. Where do you put the goalposts? I would argue Arsarctic is probably a good deck. You take that shit down into, like, 2014, that, that'll, that like, destroy the meta. That'll win a YCS. Uh, it has a strategy. It has a win condition. It has extenders, starters. It plays defensive cards. You know, like every Yu-Gi-Oh deck in the last like what seven years or something has been printed with a strategy and win con and like functions, right? Like, what do you consider good? Is it winning a locals? Is it topping a locals? Is it uh, scraping by at a regional? Or is it only to be able to uh, compete at the highest level, right? Like, where do you put the goalposts? Like, that definition exists for different people in different contexts. No Konami is they've got it rough. I think that. Still, though, you know, they could do a better job of marketing the modern things to people. Winning worlds. In ways that helped. Uh, you guys are aware, like, Satella Knight won worlds, right? Blue Eyes won worlds. Go on. Go on. Sapsford, that's it. This is, this is your barometer for what's a good deck. Right now, admit to everyone Blue Eyes is the best deck. Because that won worlds. That won worlds. Right now, tell the whole world, openly admit to everyone, you think Blue Eyes is the best deck ever made. Go. Because your barometer and measurement of a good Yu-Gi-Oh deck is winning worlds. Go, go. Tell us right now. Right now, where you're banned. Right now, Satsford. Bat chest best deck. Let's go! Teach them more um, and help them connect with the archetypes and the monsters that are being thrown as opposed to just showing them Yugi and Kaiba but then like, you know, kind of pulling the rug out from under them. Of course, um, if you are a super casual old school head, it might be worth it to take a look at the, what the new game is and try to better understand it before you just get online and complain. And if you're a super casual type, understand that not all content is even necessarily made for you, right? Like deck flexing probably wasn't made for the competitive types. It was made for the casual, you know, sort of passerby audience. And that not everybody enjoys, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of combo decks in Yu-Gi-Oh. It's a tricky one, and I guess it's not even really like a new debate. This is something that's kind of a tale as old as time, so... As always, let me know what you guys think about it down in the comments, how you feel about this discussion or debate. It's really interesting. This, like, whole video was sort of like a mishmash of different topics that all tie into, like, the same kind of thing, right? Don't they? You know, it's like, what is Yu-Gi-Oh's audience, right? Like, what what is the target demographic of Yu-Gi-Oh? Is it an age thing? Okay, what comes with that? Uh, a degree of competitiveness. Uh, the interest with regards to the game. Is it collecting? Is it playing? Is it dueling? And then when it comes to dueling, even at that point, it's like, is it old school Yu-Gi-Oh? Is it modern Yu-Gi-Oh? Is it like, do you know what I mean? Like all of this compounds into one giant mishmash of like different subjects and topics that it's like hard to really like break down where the root cause of like discrepancies are in Yu-Gi-Oh, where like people's qualms and issues with the game come from, et cetera, et cetera, right? Do you know what I mean? Like uh, it's just one big giant topic that how do you address? You know, how, what do you do? What do you do? How do you talk about this? Or whatever you want to call it. Um, and how you think Konami or players could do better, or if you think that this isn't really very much of an issue at all, and I am just making mountains out of molehills. Yeah, you're, uh, uh, you're a penis. Comments anyway. So yeah, that's going to be it. Um, cool, sweet. I'll be back with maybe more videos like this because this was fun. All right, see you guys. All right, make sure to subscribe to Team APS Amplifier. Uh, it's uh, Team APS's alt channel where they just talk into a camera. Good content, honestly. 10 out of 10. Uh, would, uh, would recommend.